Good morning, everyone. Hello. I'm going to ask you to now please uh, be quiet. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the first D-CyberLearn event. Uh, the team wants to thank everybody, and especially the sponsors, who made this possible. Uh, we want to thank you, everybody who's also here, and hopefully there's a lot of people watching on the live stream. So this is not just a conference. It's actually a get-together of builders, thinkers, and innovators to exchange ideas and to learn from each other to build the new systems of the future. So today, to welcome you for the first talk, we have Paul Kohlhaas of Molecule, the founder, uh, co-founder and CEO, then Tyler Golato, also of Molecule uh, and co-founder. Uh, oh my god, I'm completely blanking out, but I do know Vincent Weiser, who's also from Molecule, is going to be speaking as well, and Nicholas, I have to make sure I get his last name correct, Rintorf. So if you want to please give a great applause to this team that has put this together to welcome you to this event. Cool. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Kohlhaas. And uh, yeah, I'm incredibly excited to welcome all of you bright minds um, to this first DCyberlin conference. Uh, first, I want to take a personal just moment again to give a massive thank you to our team, specifically to Beata, um, Izan, Heinrich, uh, and uh, Stephen and Tilo, who are doing the live stream in the back. Um, essentially, the whole community that helped shape up this event and, and brought all of us together. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's been an incredible, I think, amount of work. I think it was only four to five weeks ago when we were formally like, okay, let's really do this this event. Uh, maybe some of you are also going to, uh, to NFT Berlin, uh, which will be happening uh, from Wednesday onwards. Um, but yeah, for us, this really marks a, kind of a first, DSI marks for us a first paradigm shift in terms of how we can really enable open science through Web3. And for us, these kind of events are incredibly important to bring together great minds um, and kind of people that are new to the space, experienced people in the space, uh, to really help co-create it together, because it's, it's at such a young phase in its development. Um, OK, maybe, maybe a quick. <laughs> For those of you that don't know me, <laughs> uh, so my name is Paul Kohl. I've actually been working on this, like, uh, this dream a little bit for the better part of, uh, of four years, uh, essentially figuring out how we can use Web3 and, and really financial systems to open up science more broadly. Um, and how did I get here? So my background is actually not a scientist. Uh, I'm an economist um, by training. Uh, and I think this marriage that DSI has of, of economics, of new incentive systems, um, together with traditional sciences and trying to improve the traditional sciences is really interesting. Uh, so my original background actually was in, um, as a teenager, I spent a lot of time online in various online biohacking forums where people were extremely openly kind of pursuing open science in a similar way almost that we see in, in software development communities, where knowledge is really readily shared, where people work in, in open data repositories. Um, and then uh, when I was, uh, I think, just about 22, 23, I started getting very deeply into the, into the crypto system because as an economist, I found that really interesting. Uh, I also spent quite a lot of time um, during my studies um, trading biotech stocks. I found it really interesting that uh, biotech stocks Typically, they just tend to behave um, based on the data of their underlying assets that those companies are developing. So you could have a, a company develop a specific asset. Openly writing about bonding curves. Um, I know we have a, one of the later speakers, Jack Scannell. Um, I remember a really <laughs> just funny anecdote where me and my co founder, Tyler, uh, traveled to London in, this was in, I think, early 2019 to uh, speak to Jack about um, the use of bonding curves 
in, uh, in the context of, um, of intellectual property assets. Um, we'll hear a lot more about that later today. Um, but yeah, just wanted to give you guys uh, yeah, some brief background. Uh, and Tyler and I have been building molecules since, um, yeah, really since, since early 2019. And uh, what we've really seen happen over the past two years uh, is that all of the kind of the puzzle pieces to really make decentralized science possible, from publishing to decentralized biotech um, to data storage, reputation systems, all of those puzzle pieces are now coming together. Uh, and so what I find really inspiring for us as a community to start putting the right pieces together to really form new research organizations and, and completely new ways of, of doing science and of liberating science. Um, so this overview is thanks to our great friends at UltraRare Bio. I don't know if anyone is here from their team today, um, but I, I find it completely, I, I assume many of you have seen this. If not, I think it's a really cool overview. This is their most recent overview of the decentralized science landscape. And what's really interesting, um, six months ago or eight months ago, this didn't exist. Like there was only, there was a couple of, of individual organizations that had started building out, but really not yet a community like this. And today we find um, a myriad of companies working on decentralized biotech. Uh, we have um, teams and networks looking at the decentralized funding of science very broadly. Uh, there's active science styles already, for example, like VitaDAO who are actively funding live research. Um, there's organizations like SciDAO emerging, LabDAO, um, and we'll hear a lot from different speakers from those organizations in the next, um, in the next few days. Uh, and our hope with this conference is actually also that, and, and this unconference actually, is that new organizations can emerge through all of us being here together. Um, there's different foundations that have emerged, there's protocols around data, um, scientific publishing, which is an incredibly large problem, like how do we make scientific publishing um, less centralized. There's different science and art NFT projects, uh, and everything is coalescing through the different communities and chats that have emerged in, in DSI. But what I find astounding is this didn't exist six to eight months ago, and it really speaks just to the, to the speed at which Web3 develop, um, communities are, are coalescing um, and, and kind of self-organizing. So what is DSI? <laughs> uh, so DSI is actually nothing that is that new. I mean, the, the D part is new, about, but open science as a movement has uh, existed for decades. But in the past, it's really failed to gain any meaningful traction. Uh, and our core thesis is it's, it's failed to gain meaningful traction simply due to a lack of incentives. And, and this is the most basic part, is what's different now? Well, with Web3, we have fundamental technology to redesign mechanisms and incentives to actually make open science possible. Um, and so I think DSI is an attempt to make the tooling, infrastructure, mechanism design, and incentive structure of open science possible using Web3. But it also doesn't do that exclusively. I think DSI and the underlying tokenomic systems that are developing in some of these cases go really beyond what open science is. Uh, and I think for open science, for example, open science never, I think, aimed at a financialization of science. But to some extent, uh, Web3 and DSI are, are doing that. And so it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how this evolves over the next couple of years. Um, and the space is still being defined. And I think we all actually have a, an opportunity and a responsibility to shape what it means and in which direction we want to take it and in which direction it falls. Because it's, it's already sprawling into many different directions, which I just think is, is so, so cool. Um, why is DSI important? Like, why are we here? Uh, we believe that if built responsibly, DSI really has the potential to enable collaborative, inclusive, and self-sovereign science. And I think this notion of science itself becoming self-sovereign is one that I find incredibly interesting. Like, you could have... Uh, scientific knowledge, uh, hypotheses, or new IP kind of bring itself to life. Because um, if you think once something is, operates in a self-sovereign, for example, tokenized system in Web3, no one can really control it anymore if the system design is in that way. And I always found this, this notion of science bringing itself to life, um, yeah, really interesting. Um, to enable a much broader participation in the sciences. I think many areas of, uh, many areas of scientific research 
um, medical research being one of them, for example, have been very closed off to the public. They haven't been inclusive um, for um, stakeholder groups like patients to really much more openly engage in. And, and I think in the same way, for example, that software development enabled anyone to become a software developer if they were 15, 16, uh, I think DSI here also has the potential to really enable a much broader um, part of society to, um, uh, to participate in science. Uh, I think to enable new funding and publishing systems, grant funding systems have been broken for, for decades in the way that we actually obtain funding for research and in the way that funding is prioritized. Um, a goal of moving power away from centralized institutions towards more localized communities that actually make decisions. And then um, ultimately enabling a creator economy for scientists. So uh, in a similar vein, the NFT art space has only been around for, what, one and a half years? Uh, I think in 2018, 2019, we saw first NFT art sales in the hundreds of thousands, maybe a few million. And I think in January this year, we topped $20 billion in NFT art sales in volume. It's just completely mind-boggling. And, and there I'm thinking, hey, what if we were able to catalyze that kind of funding and that kind of public interest sorry, uh, into, into scientific research? Uh, and I think that's really, that's really the, the larger potential here, uh, is to unlock so much value and so much, uh, I think, attention into the right things as a society. Um, and lastly, for anyone here, I think out of the, classic, the, the, the classical Web3 crowd, uh, and maybe it's interesting, it would be... Actually, wait, let's, let's try this quickly. Who here has a, like a, a scientific and academic background and not a background from Web3? Okay, wow. <laughs> I'd say that's like 70%, and who here has a background purely from Web3? Okay, wow, okay, so we're more like 80, 20 at the most, which is really cool, that's, that's really good. So maybe then to all the Web3 people, um, Web3 people and science people, uh, I think this is amazing because we all now form part of the same community, but then I'd say all of the Web3 people really ha also have an obligation here, I think, to like teach, um, uh, yeah, to teach our methods and what infrastructure is available. Uh, and for the Web3 people, I think what's so exciting here is that DSI really has, uh, um, as a space in Web3, really the potential to touch and go outside of Web3. Because in Web3 or in these crypto systems, there's been, there's been so much self-referential system building, like a DeFi system where people stake a token into a system or an IPI on, from another system and stake it back with leverage and yield. And in the end, you're like, okay, but what, what are we changing here? Like, what impact does this have? Uh, and so we've had a lot of self-referential system building in Web3. And I, to me, I find DSI really exciting to really create something that touches a patient, that changes a researcher's life, that really makes uh, scientific funding, for example, more efficient. Cool. Well, <laughs> but wait, we've been here before. <laughs> so this is, this is a, 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 just a header from the Blockchain for Science conference, which took place in Berlin at the Enhau Hotel on 5th and 6th November 2018. Was anyone from the audience there? Yes? <laughs> Theo Beutel, Tyler? Do we have Zernke Bartling in the house? No, not yet, okay, okay. Um, so what's, what's really interesting, and as a next slide, we'll, we'll go look at the agenda of that conference. Um, but so Blockchain for Science was really a, a really incredible movement that started, I think, in early 2018, um, spearheaded by Martin Etzroth, Zanke Bartling, a couple of people out of the like Berlin um, crypto space um, that were really trying to do a similar thing in terms of trying to apply uh, new crypto economic models and blockchain to, to the broader scientific industry. And I, I thought it was interesting to, and it was also a conference that took place in Berlin. Um, uh, it, interesting to kind of retro what, what happened then, and, and also just look at what did, these, what, what did we talk about back then? So <laughs> there's a couple of things that were quite similar. So talking about decentralized research data, new deals on data, um, actually we had a presentation from Ocean Protocol, uh, creating immutable research data trails, um, blockchain scalability, that's actually been solved. Um, I actually gave a first speech there about bonding curves and, and how this could be applied to pharma and molecule. You can see how long it takes to build these systems. Um, 
uh, legal aspects for, ICO, for ICOs, for research projects. We, we, I think we have a whole track later on, on legal systems and, and how we can bridge uh, those systems. And accelerating genomic data generation. There's a lot of cool stuff here and thinking there already. Um, and just a lot of similarities of what people were actually working on and, and trying to build. So, so what happened? And, and what, what can we learn from it? Um, so everyone that was building back then was incredibly well-intentioned. And uh, since we only have two people from the audience, I, <laughs> I don't know if it makes that much, that much sense to build. I mean, one thing is for certain, this, this movement started out at the beginning of a bear market. Uh, unfortunately, like markets fundamentally influence um, capital and the amount of time that people are just able to dedicate to new, world-changing projects. But uh, Tyler, any any idea from you? and build something, and I think the opportunity that we have here is to really identify who the builders are in the space, rally around them. You know, you have these sort of like, the conversation we were having with James Sinka the other day, you have sort of joiners, explorers, and, and builders. And I think the goal for this conference should be, if people are interested in this space and are interested in exploring what it actually means to get involved in decentralized science, and I'm particularly impressed by the fact that like, almost 90% of the crowd is scientists and not Web3 folks. Uh, I think what would be valuable is like, you know, really creating communities around this pro these projects. I think maybe the biggest risk that happened in 2018, if I look at those projects, were that they were building many of them in isolation, they weren't Dowified, and they didn't manage to create like these sort of unstoppable communities. And I think what's changing now, what we've learned from communities like VitaDAO or LabDAO is really the strength and the motivation for these projects to actually succeed and move forward are largely driven by the community dynamics behind them. Once you have 5,000 people, 6,000 people collaborating on a project, it's actually very hard to kill. If you're a group of five people trying to persist and build something through a ton of challenges, it can be very easy to give up. So I, yeah, maybe just as like a, a general call to action, I think the goal here is to help broaden uh, the communities behind these projects and enable anyone who's interested to actually get involved. And because of that, I think there's you know a lot of strength in these DAOs for example, um, in terms of general approach. Okay. Um, I mean, something that I can just say off the bat, I mean, just because you mentioned communities, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have Discord back then, <laughs> or, or like Slack, I mean, and so, or, and lots of people weren't actually on Twitter yet. It wasn't as widely used. So actually, as Tata pointed out, I think connectivity in the space is, is extremely important. Um, but the other thing that simply didn't exist back then, there was almost no Web3 tooling in 2018. So it was all like, yes, we could use the blockchain for this. It would be awesome to build autonomous smart contracts for, for that. But none of it existed. It was extremely hard to build. Uh, and now it's 2022, and we have fully functioning layer one chains. Um, that have shared security. We have cost-effective layer two chains uh, where you can, for fractions of cents, kind of put through your use cases, which previously was impossible. We have much better developer tooling for DAP deployment. There's complete out-of-the-box tokenization frameworks where you essentially, if you wanted to test a specific use case, like you don't need to write a single line of code. Um, there's liquid decentralized markets that you could then use for your for your tokenized use cases. There's functioning NFT marketplaces such as OpenSea, and there's fully functioning decentralized data storage systems uh, like Filecoin and Arweave. And we'll actually hear from both of those teams. Um, and a massive thank thank you to those teams as well for so sponsoring. What I actually missed as well there's fully functioning reputation systems and identity systems. Uh, I think we'll hear from um, the ceramic team. Uh, I don't know if later today or later tomorrow on that as well. So essentially, if you want to build, actually all of the tools are there. And, and so now it's more about pushing, putting the puzzle pieces together. In 2018, that didn't exist. So actually many teams back then set out to build their own blockchain for, yeah, for, uh, for scientific publishing. And then they had their own science coin. 
Um, and actually, that's another thing. I think early tokenization in the DeSci space is quite tricky and can be quite just hindering to progress, specifically because I think a scientific audience tends to be much more critical of, of tokenization and kind of anything that comes, everything that comes with that. Cool. So in the coming days, we're going to explore all of these building blocks of DSI, which I'm really excited about, uh, from decentralized publishing to funding systems, the legal systems that make them possible, decentralized autonomous organizations, distributed IP ownership, and so on. Uh, our hopes for this conference is really, I think, to inspire through talks. Uh, so these talks should really be like um, inspiring for you guys, for the audience, but then to lead to concrete outputs. So each series of talks will be followed by, um, by a set of workshops. And um, we hope that maybe each workshop that like forms, uh, someone can be a note taker and actually take notes for anyone that, that can't be in the workshops so that we can actually spread, uh, spread the vibes. Uh, and then maybe at the end of the two days, we can, we can present all the outputs. So really make this an unconference style, something where we all co-create together. Uh, and there's a ton of different workshop rooms around the venue. So if you want to be like, hey, I want to grab this person and this person and this person, and like, let's jam on the specific concept for two hours. Um, that's also what I think makes this space uh, that we share really cool. And then we hope that actually through, um, through events like this, we can enable the emergence of new projects. Uh, so, in, in decentralized biotech, I think VitaDAO, for me today, is one of the most like, leading examples of like, actually implementing DSI and, and really like, doing it. So, VitaDAO to date has funded over $2 million worth of longevity projects. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't worry. Um, has funded over $2 million worth of longevity projects. I think there's over 15 research projects from universities across the globe that have come through that pipeline. There's over 40 that are actively being vetted. Um, Vidada still has a, a very active large treasury that it's, that it's deploying into different projects. So it's also a great partner to collaborate with. And I mean, the amazing thing about Vidada is really it's a community of over 5,000 different scientists, university laboratories, including some of the leading figures in that space. Um, and I think VitaDAO has actually managed for the broader longevity community to really create a new, um, a new way of being and a new way of conducting research much more openly. And so our hope is that actually maybe we can enable the creation of organizations like that over the next couple of days. Um, so what DSI needs is really more scientists and experimentation. We also need experienced entrepreneurs. Uh, I think there's many... Uh, scientists often don't have an entrepreneurial background, and so, but it's extremely useful if you have people in your team, for example, that actually have built startups before. Um, and what we need to do is build and ship iteratively, because we're often pursuing such a big vision um, that I think it's quite important to just get to it and ship and test quickly. Uh, we also need capital allocators, both from the Web3 space and from the trad size space, um, both for-profit and non-profit. Uh, and then what we really need to take is a long-termist view and like a commitment to, to build and see things through. Um, and I'll just give an example of why I think that's really important. So organizations like VitaDAO, like I, I see lots of biotech DAOs now coming up and I'm like, wait, 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 you don't simply build a biotech DAO. It's not a Discord and like a multi-sig. Um, <laughs> even though it can sometimes seem like that from the, from the outside, but building DAOs in Web3 is incredibly hard. Like, from choosing your technical stack to what kind of DAO stack you use. How do you build a sustainable community around that that is actually really engaged and that really cares about what is being done? That doesn't just want to get in and for the token. <laughs> and then how do you actually design the tokenomics around it? Does your DAO actually need a token? Um, can it function without one is the first question. How do you finance the DAO? How do you legally wrap it? W what, is it what is it legally even? So building a DAO, regardless of biotech or science, is really hard. And then I'd say building in biotech and medicine is also really hard. <laughs> like, I think building a startup in, in medicine or in healthcare is one of the most difficult things that you can do. Or building a startup in science more broadly. Um, and then the DSI space as a whole is really still very young and fledgling. I think there's many things that we still have to learn. As I said, I think there's many first-time founders. There's a lot of idealism, which is amazing, but idealism then also needs to match like product market fit. Like you have to build something that people want, um, and it's still it's still unproven. So, I think building yeah building a biotech DAO is is hard. Um, and actually yeah building a biotech DAO in my opinion is ultra hard if you want to get it right. 
And um, through that as well, I think we, the DSI community, will face risks. Like if we don't responsibly build, uh, and if we don't ensure that people responsibly have the right frameworks to do so. Um, for example, in terms of funding, Web3 investors don't really understand biotech at all, and biotech investors don't understand Web3. So how do you build, let's say, a cohesion of people and communi a community that really is able to, to help founders in the right way in like, both of these areas? Because it takes a lot of like, subject matter expertise. Um, cool, and for us this means providing the railways and the frameworks to build in the right way early on. Um, we're... <laughs> still good? Still good? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and then uh, I'm almost, uh, almost there. Uh, I want to finish uh, just by giving a massive thank you to all of you for coming here. Uh, we also have many kind of, of our own funders and our own investors who, who, who are present today that we actually hope to seed into the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and uh, yeah, the past kind of milestone for us, just as, uh, the past, let's say, year as Molecule marks a huge milestone for us. And um, I think how is the space funded in, in DSI is a really important question. And where does funding actually come from? Uh, and we're incredibly excited uh, and, and just grateful to be able to, um, to kind of announce our funding round uh, it took us a really long time to get here and to do it sustainably. Um, we haven't actually broadly shared this yet, just because we've been so busy actually setting up this conference uh, for all of you. Um, but super happy to uh, also just announce, yeah, announce Molecule's funding round. Um, so we recently raised... <laughs> um, we, yeah, we raised 12.69 million. Uh, we formally closed it last week, and this is kind of our seed funding that will really help us um, help us build out core parts of the ecosystem. Um, there should be a more formal announcement going online once we have time after this conference. But yeah, I wanted to share that with all of you. It's from a really amazing broad network of, of funders that, that straddle both the traditional scientific space, straddle the biotech space, and are deeply involved in Web3. And our hope is actually to give a lot of that back to the community by creating infrastructure, by building tools, and uh, also by helping other people build biotech DAOs in a, in a sustainable way. Um, so th there'll be more info on this coming. I'm not gonna, not gonna go into the individual funders. Um, but then uh, just another thing that um, uh, I wanna kind of um, announce or just share with you is that we're starting out a program called BioXYZ. And BioXYZ will be a kind of a community governed and a community run uh, program to fund and incubate and launch biotech DAOs. So really help other people launch biotech DAOs in a sustainable way. Um, this will be done through, through grants of up to 100K and, and investments into those biotech DAOs. Uh, and, but really to enable people to build together, meaning like with BioXYZ, we really hope to provide the technical frameworks to launch DAOs in a safe way, uh, the tokenomic designs, kind of just open source the playbook for anyone to kind of do this and, and build. And then also to kind of have people from other biotech DAOs float into your project that you're building. So if you want to connect with people in Vita DAO and want to get help because they've done it, they know how to build a deal flow network, how to do sourcing, how to evaluate early stage IP, how to incorporate it. And so I think at this point actually in, in kind of the ecosystem's uh, point, it's really important that we share knowledge and that we build together openly to really create resilient systems. Um, cool. 